I'm absolutely honored to be here in this great state. Um, I am from West Central Indiana. I am basically right in line with the border of Iowa and Missouri. So if you just go straight across into Indiana, that's where I'm at. So all of this great state is above me. And I know that becomes challenges for cover crops. Um, so we're gonna get into that today. Um, please stop, yell, throw something if you have a question and we'll, uh, we'll just roll, okay? All right, I've, I've really started with this slide. I've added this into my deck because this is so important. If you are going to step out into this world that, that Lauren's in, Russell Hedrick's here today, uh, the world that I am, Chris Teach out, several other people in this room, um, you've got to have the support of everyone involved on your team. And that is so important because negativity is a bad thing and negativity can drag everyone down. So it's, it's great to have the support. The best thing that ever happened in 20 is those two beautiful grandchildren. So it makes what we're doing even more important for the future. Uh, I am a graduate from Purdue University, so please do not hold that against me. Um, but I'll just leave it at that. So I am a fifth generation farmer. I've been practicing now for about 37 years. Beautiful wife, Carol, two beautiful daughters. Rachel's at home with her husband on the farm. My oldest daughter, Jessica, married a farmer, but they are on their family farm. So um, it's all good. Life's good. Um, my father, Richard, was very critical in my development throughout the years. He taught me how to think, not how to farm. Big difference. You have to know how to think, and you've got to be quick on your feet and nimble and be ready to make change. Um, it's July 21st, and I'm almost through the alphabet on, on plans. It changes that quick, okay? So don't let that drag you down either, that thinking that what is wrong because I'm on... I'm through the alphabet and we're still changing plants. We're, we're at home right now planting soybeans uh, because we've got a thousand acres of corn that's drowned it out. So the world's, we don't, I'm, it took me six hours to get here and that's how much the weather is different. So nothing is, is like it used to be. Um, we've had 17 inches of rain in the last 18 days. So it's, it's unreal, you know. So we have to figure out how to roll with that. And, and that, becomes, that becomes difficult. Nephew Aaron is also on the farm. We've been no-tilling beans for about 17 years, 12 years for corn, cover crops for 12, and farming green for 10. And I'm gonna go on that in just a little bit, a detail in just a little bit. Now, I think this is very important here, this, this slide. At home, the majority of our neighbors farm corn and soybeans. That's it. We can't farm anything else. Well, we're up to seven now. Corn, soybeans, wheat, alfalfa, field peas, milo, and cattle. And then regen is plus one. Regen is when you take an acre out of production. So let's talk about Iowa. It gets cold here. You get cold sooner than I do. Your window of opportunity is a lot smaller. Okay, I've just given you three ways to work in that window now. Cereal grains, which I said wheat, so wheat, barley, triticale, whatever. Cattle, I know that's not for everybody. Regen. So take that acre out of production, you then give it a cool season cocktail, you give it a warm season cocktail, and then you give it the cocktail you want for next year's cash crop. Cereal grains, they're gonna be taken off like right now. Lauren's been taking his rye off. He's already got his beans out there in a relay situation. So things like that become creative and then 
you then figure out ways to get those cover crops. So if you did not relay and you wanted to do a cereal grain, that gives you the opportunity to get those cover crops in. First question I usually get asked is how can you take an acre out of production? How can you do that? Well, we have to stop looking at single year snapshots of return on investment. You now take that year and you combine it with the other six years of this rotation and then you do the math that way and you'll see that it makes sense. And it's not a zero because in this year you're building soil health, you're building carbon, you're increasing water infiltration rates, you're doing all these things that are those, those things right there. You need to get that on your phone, get that on your piece of paper. Everything you're going to hear from me is following those principles and we're taking them to the next level. 4,200 acres certified organic. Now this will not be an organic presentation today. It can be whatever you want it to be. I can, or we can just talk about everything that it would take to get all the way up to being organic. You can still do what we do. You know, I'm way over there because I'm beyond organic. We are doing this with no tillage. So this is all being done with cover crops, crop rotations, diversity, and livestock. But you don't have to, I'd love the company because it's lonely, but we can sure come part way and start doing some of the same things. Remainder of the farm is in transition, we'll be all the way there next year. We've used no starter fertilizer, no fungicide, no seed treatments, no insecticide for seven years now. We've also not applied any phosphorus, any potassium, or any ag lime in seven years. The pH on our farm, the average pH is 6.8 and rising. You have to always look for validations of what you're doing to, to say that this is correct. When I can stand here and tell you our pH is 6.8 and rising, that validates that what we're doing is correct because we've taken away the salts and the acids that are stripping everything out of the soil. No nitrogen applied in two years. That includes manure. Now this year we have applied some nitrogen because again, I've just about gone through the alphabet on, on plan changes. Planted 1,500 acres last, last fall to a cocktail that consisted of many other things, but part of that cocktail was fixation clover and Volana hairy vetch. Neither one survived the winter. So we're now looking at fields to plant corn into with no legumes. That's not going to work. So luckily those fields were close to a dairy. We drag lined some manure. I don't want to do that, but that was the best way to get a crop going. And by, and by the way, we drag lined those corn acres when the corn was about V4. So we planted the corn first, came back three weeks later, and went right over the top. Everything is done naturally. This is organic with no tillage. Now, the reason why we've gotten to this point is because of farming green. Farming green, uh, unfortunately, I, I don't know what is wrong with that video, but we're planting corn right there. So farming green is planting the cash crop of corn and soybeans into a living, growing green cover crop and not to terminate until after we've done that. It's very important that if you're going to go down this road of reduction of inputs, First of all, you can't do this tomorrow. It's taken years to get to this point. And secondly, you cannot go out the first warm day of spring and burn all this to the ground with chemicals because you're not going to pull this off. I've got a slide coming that shows you the power of letting these cover crops grow further into their maturity. This is also the basis of how we got started into organic. Benefits of farming, there's the same field. So we were planting corn when the rye was this tall, 
Now, I gotta, I, gotta, I gotta talk a little bit more about that. We cannot do this practice today because if you do this, you need to bring nitrogen forward into this program because there is so much being sequestered by the cereal rye, it is starving that corn plant. So bring some AMS, bring something forward and, and help that young corn plant. So that's the same field. After we planted it, we, we used the 60 foot I and J roller crimper and rolled her flat and there's what's left. So we got to maximize what that cover crop was intended to do. If it's a cereal grain, it's going to sequester nutrients like you can't believe. I do not buy into the fact that cereal rye creates an allelopathic effect on corn. I do not buy into that. What I buy into is cereal rye is sequestering the nutrients that corn needs. Okay, so let's take that same logic and let's step over and let's look into the world of weeds. It's doing the same thing to the early germinating broadleaf weeds. It's sequestering the nutrients that those weeds need and it is buckling them at the knees and then as that rye grows and shades them out, the first flush is gone. We do not see broadleaf weeds on our farm very much anymore. And we don't do tillage. We don't do anything. We, we plant cover crop, plant our cash crop, we roll it down, and we try to walk away. That's it. We may run a weed zapper, maybe. But progression is real. Broad leaves to grass to shrubs to trees. That's real. Because right now, we are in this phase of we've, we're sliding away from broadleaf pressures and we're heading into grass. And that's as big a problem as broadleaves. Maybe bigger. So then you have to figure out timing of changing things. So when does foxtail come on? So let's think about that. Okay, so if you agree with me that, that this cereal rye is sequestered those nutrients, and then we're gonna terminate it, and two weeks later, or t within two months, that cereal rye is gonna exhaust those nutrients back out into the profile. It's now ready to feed those late coming weeds, which are like foxtail. And boy, does it go. It can get bad in a hurry. So we have to think about how do we offset that. So then wheat comes into the picture because in my opinion, wheat's gonna be mature and done its thing before the foxtail's coming. So you're gonna harvest that off, follow that with a, like a, an oat package to smother that foxtail out. And now we're gonna get ahead of the foxtail game. Nitrogen fixing, if it's a legume package, you want it to fix as much nitrogen as you can. I told you we're not applying any nitrogen, so this is how we feed the corn. Growing carbon, if you want to be in these, these, these carbon market world, you're going to have to abide by these principles because they're going to lay down certain rules that we're going to have to follow, and they're going to be uh, backgrounded by those principles of soil health. Erosion control. I don't care where you live, there is erosion. I think the gentleman behind me is probably on a 0% slope on a lot of his farm. Is that right? He's got erosion. Guarantee it. Keep it covered. Keep the armor on. Increased pounds of biomass. That's what this world's all about now. Larry was talking earlier. If we want to slow down runoff, the surface runoff, this is one of the ways. We've got to have the ground covered. Feeding microbes, it's all about feeding microbes. Armor the soil. Um, one day we were planting corn. I, I do a lot of testing, I take notes, I take a lot of information down. One day we were planting corn into a cover crop about this tall and it was 92 degrees out. That, that's the kind of year we've had. We were dry early, got wet, got hot, and then got wet. And now we're hot again. So anyway, I opened up that canopy, stuck the thermometer in, it was 70 degrees. 
pulled the thermometer out. There was a bare spot on the ground. I set it on the ground. It was 110. 40 degrees difference from that, that sunspot burning down to inside that canopy. I want to be in that world right here. Limit evaporation. Talk about needing that in this part of the world. If we had the soil covered, you've worked so hard to build soil health, build carbon, increase water infiltration rates, increase water holding capacity. We've worked hard to gather all this. So then when Mother Nature fills your profile in the winter and the spring months, you want to keep that there for days like today. I can't imagine the evaporation rate out of the soil profile today going to the atmosphere. We've got to slow it down. Suppress weeds. That's what this world I'm in now is. But we can all, again, if I'm over there, that's fine. So now let's, let's, let's start eliminating burn downs. Let's use the cocktails up front to hold the weeds early, eliminate burn downs, and then scout your fields and post spray as needed. That's all I'm asking. Balance. It's a symbiotic relationship with Mother Nature. That's why we can get to where we are. There is a, there, you have a full lineup of awesome speakers today. And Dr. Rick Haney is one of them, the man. He is the man. And he invented a, a soil health test. Not a soil test, a soil health test test. There is a plethora of information in this test. I'm going to talk about two things today. Balance. Predator to prey. When you start looking at why can you plant non-GMO corn without any insecticide, it's because we've taken away the caustic acids and the pesticides and the insecticides and all these other things that are killing the beneficial species. When we maintain balance, that's how you can move into this world. Is there root feeding taking place? Probably, but I don't think it's enough to hurt yield. I mean, we've been doing this for seven years. This will be the eighth year. Bacteria to fungi is another balance factor that Rick looks at in his test. When we started down this journey, we were a bacterial-based farm. Now we are a full-blown fungal-based farm, and that's exactly where I want to be. Want to be growing fungi as much as we possibly can. The mycorrhizal, the arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi are the backbone of the communication network amongst the microbial biome. If anything's going to happen, it's going through that network. So that's why I am so adamant against tillage. Because if you constantly break these communities down and all they do is spend their time rebuilding the community just in time to have it wiped out again, what in the world are they doing toward building soil health? Nothing. And, and, and tillage, all tillage does is re-germinate more seeds from the seed bank. So we have to stop tillage. This is the row unit. Everybody wants to know how complex our row unit is. Well, it's very simple. There is no coulter on it, and there is no uh, row cleaners. It's a double disc opener and a closing system. That's it. I always, I'd like, I, I like to, to tell stories. That's why I usually run over on time. But the other thing that you, I think is critical here is we have a precision add-on called Delta Force. Now, I don't sell anything, so I don't care what brand you use. I don't care what color it is. I don't care. But with Precision, it's ran by an iPad. And within that app, there is a feature called Applied Downforce. 
and applied downforce is the, is the difference between the weight of the row unit hanging on that bar and the number that you punch in that you want to have applied for down pressure. They've, Precision's figured out to do the math and as you're running through the field, it's telling you what that change is. We are almost always running negative numbers. That means we're lifting through the field. I mean, I, I, run, I go into the store one day and I run into a local farmer and he's complaining about how hard it is to plant his crop. And I'm like, well, what do you mean? Well, I'm up to 400 pounds of downforce. I'm like, you're doing what? Well, I'm up to 400 pounds of downforce and I can't get my planter on the ground. Bob, I'm running negative 150. So the delta force is going to hold that row unit where it belongs as you just glide through the field. I mean, we're, we're pulling a 60 foot, 20 inch row spacing planter and the RPM on the tractor is about 1400, 1500. That's it. It just glides through the field. Weapon of mass destruction number one. I don't care what color it is. I don't care what choice it is. I don't care if you got a vertical till with a, a, a box on, a Gandhi box or a, a Valmar. I don't care. Get the cover crops planted. That's all I care about. Weapon of mass destruction number two. I and J 60 foot roller crimper. This is how we do the bulk of our termination of cover crops. So now it's added a whole nother layer of management because now you can only think about species that we can terminate with the crimper. For example, rape is a tremendous cover crop, in my opinion. It's very hardy. It can survive the winters even here in Iowa. It'll be here next spring but I can't terminate it with that roller crimper, so it's out. But again, if you don't want to come all the way and you still are going to use some chemistry, then go for it. The power of Balanza Fixation Clover. This is where I'm going to start talking about where I'm going to ask you to now start reducing your inputs. Okay, this was a cocktail that cost about $25. You go out and you measure a two foot by two foot square and you clip everything at ground level in that square and you put it in a bag and send it to your lab. Now you're doing a two foot by two foot so now you can get the amount of acre that is. You do the math. So on May 20th, this, this Balanza had fixed 75 pounds of nitrogen. On June the 4th, it's fixed 114 pounds of N, and our biomass is up to 6,800 pounds. Now, if you just wait four more days, look at the numbers now. This is what I'm talking about, farming green. So by waiting until June the 8th, we are now going to take credit for everything on this line. And folks, there's 25 other things out here to the right that I didn't even put on the slide. Okay, Rick, I don't want to plant corn on June the 8th. I get it. So how about we plant corn on May 28th? And how about we don't terminate for six days and we now let this go and we're somewhere in this 130 to 140 range now. So let's assume it's 140 pounds of in. We could sit here and argue all day long about how much this is available for the plant today. And we're not going to. We're not going to do that. I've been doing this a long time. I take my tests every year. We do this. We pull nitrate to cores one and two feet deep. I've done all the stuff to to verify. I'm going to take half of that credit now. So 140 pounds, half of that's 70. I'm going to say right now nitrogen is probably costing 80 cents a pound. That's $56 an acre of savings. Now subtract the 25 off and we're left with what, 31? 30, but Rick, we can't plant cover crops. We don't make any money. Really, 31 bucks. That just, I've just done that 
to cover the nitrogen side. What's that right there worth? What's 444 pounds of that worth? All this is coming with it. So this is what I'm talking about. Larry was talking about we've got to figure out how to reduce the loads of, of these nitrates and whatever else you're, you're going to collect data on into our streams and our creeks. And, and by the way, trout in Iowa, I never knew. That's crazy. It's crazy good. But we've got to protect that, that wildlife. So I can't think of a better way by doing it than planting some cover crops. And I'm asking you now to reduce your synthetic load of nitrogen by 70 pounds and let that 70 pounds come from this right here. Came back about three weeks later and look at how much has been exhausted. It's real, folks. The sample that was pulled on June the 8th had 5,200 pounds per acre of organic carbon. As you would expect, it's a carbon to nitrogen ratio of 20 to 1. So now, I now live in a world of what I call 70-30. I need to have the cover crop do 70% of the weed suppression and the canopy of the cash crop is going to do the other 30. So if you are going to plant corn into this world and it is going to burn up that fast from that time period, you better be getting your corn up and it better be getting the canopy because there's going to be weeds coming after that gets burned up. I also call this the power of patience. Okay, this is a mix I came up with, and you can tweak this. If I was going to tweak this any, I would add five pounds of Bellana hairy vetch. That's what I would add to this. Okay, uh, I like the oats, I like the sorghum sudan, I like the tillage radish, and I would add any amount and all diversity you can. But remember, we've got to know what your freeze date is, because if you're going to do this in Iowa after October 1st, forget about it. It's too late. So now we, you know, this needs to be done third week, fourth week in August, first week in September. How are we going to do that? Cereal grains, regen, livestock. Okay. Hopefully the winter pea survives and the tillage radish survives. Then you've got this. This is unbelievable. This is a sea of white blooms from the fixation clover. And that tall stuff you see are not weeds. That is the pea climbing up out of the, out of the, the clover. The planter is in the up position. So this stuff's about, it's above my knee high. OK. This will be some of the absolute best planting you've ever done. That same row unit I showed you earlier, just drive right through it and plant corn. I mean, look at that. That's crazy. So now come in, if you want to spray some glyphosate, come in with about 12 ounces. You don't need very much. About 12 ounces with maybe a gallon of 28. And just fry it. <coughs> this is the most efficient way to build soil health quickly. Now, this isn't for everybody, okay? And honestly, the best cattle to maybe own would be your neighbor's cattle because then you, you, you get them, he'll pay you a rate of gain, and you say, Bob, here you go. Here's your cattle back. You fight the mud this winter. I'll see you next spring. That would be a great way to do it. Now, I'm trying to get the dairies that are in the area, I'm trying to get their heifers that they're going to put back into their milking lineup and bring them to me as three weights. We graze them for 90 days and they return back to them as five weights. I can't get them there yet because they are convinced that I will, I will upset 
the rest of their herd and the timing of when they all are going to mature. I, it's a bogus excuse, but that's what they're giving me today. I'm going to keep working on it. Again, this isn't for everybody. Nutri okay, here's the power of cereal rye. Again, farming green. Okay, this was a cornfield last, last fall. It was then drilled with a 100 pounds of Elbon cereal rye. It grew, it went into dormancy, came out, and then we start testing. Okay, same thing, two feet by two feet, clip it, send it to the lab. Now, the only thing I'm doing different now is instead of doing this on a height, I'm doing it every Monday. And we do it on the first Monday that I feel like it's coming out of dormancy and we go all the way through October. Because I want to see where it goes to and where it falls to and when. So 12 inch rye, I'm going to guess most rye in the United States is, is chemically terminated at this height because we can't let it get out of control. We've done some good. It's definitely worth doing, but there's way more on, to, on the table here. In four days, that's all it took to go from 12 inch rye to 18 inch rye, four days, look at the numbers now. Now we're gonna plant soybeans into this field. We need potash. Look at the potash number. I've already done the conversion, 0060. And look at this nitrogen number. Now do you understand why you need to move nitrogen forward in a corn into cereal rye program? Look at it now, 28 inch rye. Look at our potash, we're up to 281 pounds of potash. This is just above ground. Our biomass is hitting almost 7,000 pounds. The nitrogen is, is ballooned to 134. So this is why I stood up here earlier and said, I do not buy into allopathy. I buy into this. <clears throat> Two months after we roll crimped it, I came back and took a sample of the dead material. This is what was left. Look at the amount of potash that had been exhausted over 230 pounds, or 220 pounds. That's crazy. So, we don't do the traditional soil testing anymore, but the last time we did it was a year ago. So seven years into this elimination of inputs, our fertility levels have either stayed the same or increased. Because one of the questions I always get asked is, Rick, aren't you mining your farm? I don't think so. There's thousands of pounds of these nutrients below our feet. We just need to figure out how to unlock them. Okay, this is how we do soybeans, and this is how anybody in this room could do soybeans. No-till soybeans at boot stage. That rye is about 50 inches tall, and as long as you don't disrupt it and keep it attached, you'll go right through it. Now, I'm a very blessed individual in many ways. One of the ways I'm blessed is I've met the right people at the right time. I, I got to meet Dr. Aaron Silva, and that's where I also met Lauren Steinlage. Wherever Lauren's off doing Lauren stuff, that's fine. That's where I also met Lauren about seven years ago. When I read the headline, you're going to plant soybeans at boot stage and then you're going to wait 45 days and roll it all down with the crimper. I'm like, you're going to do what? I'm in. So I go to, Matt, go to Madison, Wisconsin. Dr. Silva uh, teaches Lauren, myself, and 35 or 40 other farmers how to do this, and this is what we're doing now. This was the segue into organic with no tillage. So the first thing we did year one 
was we still use some chemistry for burn down and we still use some chemistry for post. And by the way, that's how we started to eliminate chemistry was we stopped using full rates, half rates with the conjunction of cover crops. Second year in, let's take one field out of 2,000 acres and let's stop post spray or let's stop burn down and let's do post spray only. Year three, we're stopping post spray altogether. We're going to scout for, or we're going to stop burn down altogether, post or scout for post. Then I'm saying to myself, this is silly. Why aren't we going all the way and let's just go organic? And that's what we did. So, that's pass number two of what I call the three pass system. Pass one was planting those cover crops last fall. So now when I do a, a, a sequence of slides like I'm getting ready to do, this is the same field, okay? That's the same field. That's my baby, the 60 foot I and J roller crimper. We are crimping the beans and the rye all at the same time. The beans are at V1 and a half to V2 growth stage. Now the reason why this works the way it does, it's nothing magical. It's the fact that from boot stage to anthesis, which is when you want to roll the rye, it's about 40 days. So 40 days will keep your bean growth under V3. Because if we get to V3 and beyond, we're going to shred leaves, break branches, and it's not going to be pretty. You're going to have a bunch of kinked over soybeans. Okay. Here is what the bean looks like. And again, remember, this is an organic situation, no chemistry. Here comes the roller. I just about got ran over. It was close. You'll see how close it was. Now, we didn't get a great roll this year on the rye. And I was talking to Chris Teach out about that yesterday. Now, I'm going to find the, look, you're going to go down and we're going to see the beans. But have you seen any broad leaves in this whole time I've shot this video? Not very many. The beans are fine. And I was talking to Chris Teach out yesterday. The, the rye seems to be getting a very fine stem. And it's not roll crimping as well as it used to. Now maybe we're planting too thick. Maybe I've gone too far on the rate. But it's not rolling as well as it used to. Now that's okay but you really need to get it flat to help suppress the weeds. Now the other thing that's happening here is we are, the crimper is, is hitting that apical bud and it's not killing it, but it now sends a message to the bean plant that we need to stack nodes. And that's what happens here. It's amazing. Our nodes are typically two to three inches apart or tighter instead of four or five or six inches, the nodes are real tight. Tighter nodes means more, the chance of more blooms, which then means the chance for more pods. That's what the field looked like a couple days ago. Again, there is some, there's the foxtail I was talking about that's going to start to come. If, if we could see better, you could still see the mat of mulch right there. But now we are just about ready to close. So the 70-30 rules got to come into play in a hurry. So now, you know, maybe what we've done, I like, I like using the corn planter to plant beans because the corn planter is so accurate on depth. But I think we need a narrower spacing. So we're probably, and we did drill some beans this year and they look pretty good. The thing about drilling, it knocks a lot of the rye down at the time of planting and some of it doesn't stand back up 
and then you've now let light can start to go through, and then it, it, it's a pre it becomes a preference thing on what, what you want to do. But the row spacing is kind of important here, in my opinion, to go narrower. There's a lot of people talking about going wider, especially in corn. Okay, this is just a, a pretty cool video I took, and this is, again, you've got to be flexible. So we were wet all the way up until it was uh, at anthesis. You can see the, the rye, the, you can see the pollen flying off right across top of the rye. We've got the planter right behind it. Now this particular planter still has row cleaners on it, but they are up not doing anything. The reason why we're doing this this way is because it's June the 2nd and the rye is already at anthesis, so it's ready to terminate. So we went ahead and rolled the rye right ahead of the planter. There's what the field looks like on July 16th. No potash, no inputs of any kind. This is definitely something everyone in this room can try. There's the same field on October 17th, harvesting, soy, harvesting the soybeans. That hole right there is not from weeds, that's from voles, little field mice. Okay, cocktail packages I think will be prescribed for weed problems. I, I truly believe this. I think we're going to be able to sit down and say that we've got these three, these three weeds that we're worried about. So we now know that, that these three cocktails are going to send signals underground that are going to disrupt those weeds or send signals out to get help from somebody to take care of that weed problem. I am convinced that's coming sooner than later. Nutrient density goes up as soil health goes up. There are no failures. That is too negative of a word. It's outcomes we did not expect, and what are we going to do to never do it again? Carbon markets will require soil health practices. I guarantee it. Do not underestimate the power of what's going on in this room today. Talk to the, the, the presenters today, talk to Lauren, talk to the local farmers. You've got all kinds of growers that are here today that can answer questions. Take advantage of it. Unfortunately, a farmer's success is measured by yield. That's very unfortunate because there are so many other ways to measure success. Soil health, human health being a good steward, being a conservation-minded person, being socially accepted. Many more ways to measure success. View cover crop is as important as the cash crop. Three-pass system, I already talked about it. Stop looking at single-year ROI, take the average. I talked about that. Diversity is essential. The more biomass, the better. Let's talk about diversity for a moment. One of the things that when people talk about diversity, what they're referring to most generally is massive cocktails of cover crops. I'm going to go even further. Now, if you're in a world of chemistry, then bring perennials in. So don't just plant a cocktail of annuals plant some perennials too. But be careful, if you're gonna use chemistry, that's fine. If you're not, you can't do it because that roller crimper is not gonna terminate a perennial. That's another way for diversity. And I think a third way to look at diversity is cash crops. Another way of the future is gonna be raising multiple cash crops at the same time. We're doing it now. We've got wheat and winter hardy peas planted together. They will be harvested together. They will either be taken to the dairy and fed as a nutritional input. It's gonna raise their protein by about 5%, or you can take it to a, a separator and you can have them separated out and sell them each as individual into a different market. And then to go one step further, 
I gave up on the wheat early on and we put beans out there because I just punted on the whole project. And then after the beans were planted and they came up, guess what happened? The wheat took off. The wheat started to grow and it looked great. So we've kind of done Lauren's relay, kind of. We clipped the top of the wheat off with the peas right above the beans that are there. And now the beans are coming behind the, the wheat. But unfortunately, we couldn't get across all the acres in time because the beans grew so rapidly, they outgrew the wheat. Continue to Haney soil health test. It is imperative to continue to Haney test. Let me tell you how we do it. It's a fairly expensive test, so you're not going to be able to do this like you would on a grid, grid sample test. So what we do is we take the farm and we, we've broken it down into pieces of like 500 acre chunks. And I've tried to put the acres together that have similar topography, slope, fertility, all of these things. I then pick one field out of that 500 acre area and we do three locations within that field. The highest productivity, the lowest productivity, and the average productivity. These spots are geospatially marked, so we go back to them every time. Then we pull samples three times a year. Spring, summer, fall. And again, it is a snapshot in time. So is it important? Yes. But remember, it's a snapshot of time because let's say we took the test a week earlier or a week later and a rain event occurred somewhere in there, it's going to change the test. So I then look at averages. Where is is organic carbon heading. What, I've been doing this for 10 years. We've got all this data plotted. Where is it heading? Is it up, down, sideways? Then you can start to make your agronomic decisions. But we don't apply any inputs, so the only thing I'm using the soil health test for is just to see how we are progressing on applying the principles. Do whatever you can to have a cover on every acre, establish a baseline to monitor change. How do you know where you're going unless you know where you've been? If you don't track where you are, you're not gonna be able to sit down at the end of the year and make, make valid decisions. Test on your own farm to see what works or does not work. I've came from Indiana. I can't guarantee that what we're doing is gonna work on your farm. So please test what we've talked about here today on your farm. Mother Nature has guided me exactly where to go. I could spend a whole presentation on just that. I don't have enough time. Do not jeopardize the livelihood of the farm. Please, please, please. That crazy, wacky guy from Indiana came and told me that this was all going to work. You can't do it on every acre the first day out the, out the door. Progression is real. I've already talked about that. Remember, the people who are being talked about are the ones who are creating the change. Change is good. Change is hard, but change is good. The success of next year's cash crop starts with the success of this year's cover crop. It's that important. Don't make excuses that support your agenda. Stop hitting the easy button. Topsoil, young man in Iowa, great state of Iowa, young man not far from here, Mitchell Hora, has quite the platform. I don't sell, I don't get paid anything from Mitchell. I'm just up here to tell you that this is probably the best platform I've ever seen in the ag sector. As far as taking any flavor, any color, any manufacturer of data, being able to assimilate it, collate it, package it, uh, uh, protect it, never sell it to anybody else. You can query it. You can ask what if questions. You can, you can do regression. You can do pressure testing. 
It's unreal. Now, I'll tell you where I really think it's going to shine for folks like me that are heading down this organic world is when you move down this world, paperwork is unreal. It's about this much paperwork. It's unreal. So what we're doing is we're talking to the certifying agency and we are, we are soon to have them approve that will you let us collect our daily activities through this platform and then collect it into a folder and push it to you for our certification process. That's a big deal. So check, check Mitchell's stuff out. Bright young, bright young man. He's got, he's got more energy than I got, and I didn't think that was possible. He'll be here this afternoon. Be here this afternoon. We, I hope he can get his head through the door. I've pumped him up so much. <laughs> Weeds are telling the story. Pay attention. Pay attention to what they're telling you. 70-30 rule talked about it. Tillage has to stop, in my opinion. I think it is very, very harmful to the system. Good data leads to good decisions, which then puts you in a position of strength. Okay, this is probably the most powerful slide in the whole deck right here. Stability. The only way you get this is by collecting data. Okay. Standard deviation here is yield. So I know it's hard to see, but this is, this is before cover crops. We had a standard deviation of almost 30 bushel, meaning if you were to drive through the field harvesting, you'd have a 30 bushel swing of yield. Again, this validates that what we're doing is correct with the addition of cover crops. And then as you can see, we started cover crops back over here somewhere. But as you can see, it takes a little bit of time for the system to get going. But once we got the system rolling, we dropped our standard deviation to less than five. Soybeans, it went from nine to less than three. That tells me that the cover crop slash no-till program has brought stability to our system. Again, another validation that what we're doing is correct. The, the previous slide was good data leads to good decisions that put you in a position of strength. I'm in a position of strength here. We're in a very volatile uh, market right now. I mean extremely volatile. If somebody sneezes the wrong way, the market's moving a, a limit move. Well, we can now feed into that market and start selling based on this stability. Input reductions. I brought this up current, or no, I didn't. I don't think I got the right slide on there. Okay, this is up to 2020's numbers. So we've cut diesel fuel by 50%. We've cut tractors by 60%. No more synthetic in, no more map, no more potash, no more lime, no more chemistry. Now these are all averages because some years in the past we may have had 4,000 acres of corn and 2,500 acres of beans, or we may have had 2,500 acres of corn, 1,000 acres of wheat, 1,000 acres of alfalfa. So this is an average of what we kind of used to apply across the farm. What, what do those numbers mean? Yes, I did do this in today's numbers. Diesel fuel, that savings is 47,000. Synthetic in 315, MAP 183, potash 193, lime 77, chemistry almost 300,000. That, that is insane that we used to spend $300,000 in chemistry. $1.1 million. That's real money. So let's say, you know what, Rick, I don't want to be in your world. I don't want to go all the way. Well, that's fine. Cut that in half. $500,000. This can be done. You got people coming behind me that are going to validate what I've talked about today. 
This number is repeatable every single year because we no longer use those inputs. Gunslinger, this is what you want Gunslinger to look like on September 18th here. You're gonna need this kind of growth. Look at the, look at the oats. My rule of thumb on a clover is we need to get to third trifoliate in this fall to have a chance to survive the winter. Third trifoliate. You're going to need 45 good day growing days, at least 45. Can you aerially apply that? You can. I've not had much success. The question was, can you aerially apply? Yes. I've not had a lot of success. Now, I think what might be Another viable choice would be, and these are getting popular, are these, these uh, Millers or the high, the Hagees that'll go through this corn at, at 12 feet tall, put the cover crop package on and blow it in. You can have problems though with getting sunlight in there to help yep. it germinate it though. But the thing you're ahead of the game on is you've got it there, it's probably gonna start to germinate because the leaves are gonna start to be dropping. Then when you harvest, it's ready to go yep. versus the drills in the field with you. Now you got to wait seven or eight or nine days for emergence and then it goes. Now I'm not saying one's better than the other, but seed to soil contact is always a good idea. Okay? This is what we planted into this spring with corn. Now I'm a little bit too early here because if you'll note, well, this, this particular video is not going to show it. The next one will. But there you go, no coulter, no row cleaners. Oh yeah, it is gonna show it. See how we don't have any blooms yet on the clover? I'm too early. And look, I mean, there's no broad leaves. There's nothing. But here's the thing. We have had six wet springs in a row. In 19, we didn't plant anything in May or April. We planted the whole farm after June 2nd. Field conditions were awesome. I said, we're going. Let's get this one field planted. And that's what we did. This is that same field, but now I'm on the ground and I'm gonna show you what kind of world that seed is living in. Look how beautiful this is. Look at that. Look at all those fibrous roots sticking out. And that seed slot is beautiful. It looks like a jungle up here, but down there where that seed is, it's a pretty good world to be in. Now right there, what you're looking at is about 12,000 pounds of biomass. I thought, man, there's no way. There is no way we're gonna roll crimp, first of all, the, the clover's not ready. And second of all, that's too much. So then you got to go to plan X. And we brought out the flail chopper, which I really like this piece of equipment. So now we're coming back. The corn was probably about V3. If we look, there's, I'm going to show you. There, there's the corn right there. See him? He's right there. There's one there. Okay, so then what we're doing here, look at all the, the clover is now in bloom. So now we can think about terminating it. So now there's where the flail choppers ran. Now look, I'm gonna show you the corn. It's, it's fine, we took a couple of the tops off. But it's okay. So now we've given this corn an avenue out. This is what I really like to do right here. Jay, I'm almost done. Alfalfa. Okay. Let me, let me go all the way back to the beginning. Let's say you want to start moving toward being an organic farmer. This is how we transitioned a lot of acres on our farm. We've got, we're lucky. I told you I'm blessed in many ways had a dairy come into our backyard, we can now transition alfalfa acres, generate income by selling that alfalfa to the dairy while we're getting certified organic. We are clipping it, or the dairy's clipping it every 27 days, so now your weed 
pressure is almost zero because you've taken it off every 27 days. This is where we do bring solid manure back though. From the, you have to. Removal is too much. What have I done here? I've pushed buttons, haven't I? Or no, is that the same? That was the same slide, wasn't it? Okay, sorry. So now we've used this alfalfa to be a transition tool. So this alfalfa that you're looking at right here is two years old. So now it's about, look at that, isn't that beautiful? It's about 30 inches tall. We're going to no-till corn right into it. Then we're going to come back and we're going to do this right. Well, here's another, I'll just run this video. I love these drone videos. I'll just run this one. This one really is pretty cool because he's going to do a 360 and come all the way around. And I'm telling you, if you want to have a big smile on your face planting corn, you plant it into that right there. There is so much fibrous roots, the seed slot just falls back together. But look at that. Okay, now we're going to do, we're going to get the baby out. And we're going to roll this alfalfa flat, and I need to change this slide just a little bit because I'm saying that we're going to do this at V1. I need to take this to V2. You are not going to hurt the corn. Now, we know that this is not going to terminate the alfalfa. We know that. The crown's still below the ground. Alfalfa is very tough. It doesn't want to give up. But what we're doing here is we are laying the alfalfa flat to give the corn the daylight that it needs to get going. Folks, this is the easy part. The hard part is the next 14 days wondering if this corn's going to live. Be careful doing this. Do you bump up your population just a little bit? A little bit, 42,000. 42,000 on 20 inch rows. Okay. Now, another thing we've get, we're doing an experiment this year is we're planting corn on 10 inch spacing. My 70 30 rule. But now here's what I found out by watching this test develop. You've got four inch wide gauge wheels on either side of the double disc opener. So you're, you're laying down four inches of cover crop slash alfalfa. You then set over 10 inches and plant again. So that rate is 44,000. So it's 22,000 on the first 10 inch pass, 22,000 on the second 10 inch pass. But here's what I found out. By running those gauge wheels that close to each other with that much, the planter weight down, we are really knocking the cover crop out. And that test strip that we ran in multiple fields was the first corn that emerged out of the ground. And the first corn that climbed out of this world. So that means something to me. Because we struggled this year with trying to get the corn to get above the clover and go. It would get above the clover, we would run, uh, Lauren works for Dawn and, and Dawn has an in-row roller and we would run that in-row roller and knock that clover down enough to where the corn could get a, a breath of fresh air. You'd swear the corn was going to take off and it just laid there. And then here comes the clover again. So we're battling now genetics. Again, these are my thoughts and opinions, but current genetics are incorrect for what we're trying to do. Current genetics of corn are bred for dis mass destruction of the soil and high fertility and high synthetic chemistry. That's not the world we live in. So we need to now change and I'm trying to go back 30 years. We've started this in soybeans. We've, we now own 10 soybean lines that have gone off patent. We've grown them out in South America. They'll be here this, by next spring. We're gonna start planting test plots of these 10 that I picked out. And we're gonna to start to find 
the soybean genetics that are going to thrive in this system, and we're going to start to do the same thing with seed corn. I think Lauren is on to a great thing with this open pollinator corn. His seed bank is probably 200 years old. And I can see it in his test plot. So things to think about. OK, again, like I said, when I set this up, it's the same field every time. Here's that field of alfalfa, planted into the alfalfa. You can't do that, Rick. You cannot plant a warm season grass into an established perennial with no tillage. Now, the other thing to keep in mind here is this field was attacked by black cutworm twice. And I will sacrifice yield to maintain soil health every single minute of every day. So we did not spray anything, even if it was OMRI approved. OMRI is an acronym for an organization that approves products to be sprayed or used on organic certified acres. So there is a product out there that the organic world has said is safe to apply, but we didn't apply it. So by the time the, the black cutworm got through wreaking their havoc, it was about June 22nd. Well, corn planted, so basically we planted corn on June 15th, basically, because at that point, on June 22nd, the corn's about this tall. It's just regrowing. Corn planted on June 15th in Indiana is not going to yield very good. So now you have to look at what is realistic. Would I like to have 200 bushel organic corn? Yeah. Are we going to raise it? Probably not. So what's realistic? 140 bushel to me is realistic. Remember, we've got no inputs and we're selling corn. Well, I'm selling corn and it's got a one in front of it. Okay? So 140 bushel yields pretty good if you run the math. This, my expectation of this field at this moment in time was half of my expected or my realistic yield goal. This field did better than half, so I was happy. So it was a victory. This truly illustrates what I call farming green. The thing you really have to struggle with here is to stay awake, the driver, because there's nothing going on except planting corn. Again, I've shown you a lot of positive things. There are a lot of negatives involved here. Please be careful and please go slow. Now, now I, I gonna, I'm going to go through this really quick because I think this is important for you folks here. We struggle with trying to figure out how to get legumes planted in the northern states. These winter hardy peas are gaining popularity. We planted our wheat on, I think I planted the wheat on um, October the 2nd, I think. October 3rd, somewhere in that area. So then on November the 1st, the wheat was about this tall. I went in with the corn planter and planted peas three inches deep. And that is what they look like on December the 10th. So the ground level is about, about right here. I thought, oh boy, they weren't supposed to come out of the ground yet. We're not going to have anything. There they are this spring on March the 6th. So now, we have no, I've now shown you how to move your window of opportunity by 30 days and plant a winter hardy pea that will be here for next spring's corn crop, wheat crop, milo, millet, whatever. There they are. I don't have the date, but there they are. You can't do that. Oh, yes, I can. Sacrifice yield to maintain soil health. Do it every day. Grow nitrogen or go online. Uh, search Dr. Um, Christine Jones from Australia. She's got a series from um, 
uh, Green Cover. And in one of her episodes in Green Cover, she talks about using species of the right categories to fix nitrogen without any legumes. Plant green in the living cover crops, plant beans in the 72 inch rye, plant corn in the cereal rye, just move your nitrogen forward. It's okay to have 23 plans. Like I said, we're just about through the alphabet now and it's July. Park your planter no matter the date. I don't care what your neighbors are doing. If your fields aren't fit, don't be out there. Don't plant corn in April again. I love the bean, uh, the bean scenario from Dr. Silva because now we've totally flipped everything. So I don't want to plant corn until after Mother's Day because that's how long it's going to take for the legume packages to fully kick into high gear. That's perfect. Let's move forward. Let's plant beans at boot stage in April and May. We'll plant corn after May 20th. It's a beautiful thing. Plant multiple cash crops in the same field. I, I think another thing to think about is move your row spacing out to 90 inches or maybe 120, and let's start planting uh, vegetables up the middle of those two corn rows. Pumpkins, what, whatever. And now let's start figuring out how to maximize and vertically integrate the operation that we have. Totally eliminate all inputs. I took zero C fat payments last year, zero. Don't need them. Eliminated crop insurance three years ago. No longer am involved in any government programs, ARC or PLC. Regen acres, no cash crops, certified organic with no tillage, the three pass system. To truly be regenerative, you have to take everything away, and I mean everything. If you're not uncomfortable with what you're doing, then you are not trying hard enough to change. I don't care what you are doing in your life, that will fit anybody in this room. I had health issues arise a few months back. You don't appreciate how health is until you don't have it. So then you make change. You know, cover crops, the way I got started in cover crops, I viewed them as a defensive mechanism. Defense, defense against erosion. Today, they are a defense mechanism and an offensive juggernaut because they are currently saving over a million dollars of inputs on our farm. Same thing with what I'm talking about here. I was, um, I was one of the biggest hypocrites you could imagine to myself. I was dedicating my life and everything I had toward maintaining soil health and I did not maintain human health. So now I'm on the defense. Please don't do that. I challenge everyone here to get a little uncomfortable. I think you will like how it feels. I'm proud to be a farmer, but I am way more proud of the way I farm. Regenerative organic stewardship with no tillage. Thank you very much. <laughs>